Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to Fast Lane 2016. We are in room Vincent. In a few minutes, or just in half a minute maybe, we will hear a talk what the code reviews in Microsoft and in open source projects have in common. We'll hear a battle uh, by Chen. Um, he's working as a professor at the Delta University of Technology. He's researching there. Well, you know, I think, let's begin. Thank you very much.
if for any strange reason this name doesn't work, that's the Google form name that I have worked. First, so one more minute. Unfortunately, there is not much research that tells us exactly 
what spoiler views are used for, and why and how you should do that. The second point is that it seems there are many glitches with modern coding views, and it's very important to understand that, to understand what the challenges are, what the outcome is, to see what can be improved. So these are the main two reasons why it's important, in my opinion, to care about coding views. So, to focus on these two things, the first thing that we thought about doing was trying to see what happens when real developers, professional developers, do code reviews. Um, because for literature, what you have is literature about code inspections, something that was done around in the 80s and 90s, in which you had very formal meetings in which you would stop coding for like three days, send the code to the other team members, the team members would check it, and then you meet in a meeting and go line by line, one line by one line to find all the errors in that code, and once everybody is happy, then this can be merged. But this took forever, and not, not many companies are doing this nowadays. But what we know about code inspections is that it engages developers and others in a formal process that usually detects more defects in the product than does machine testing. So, the question that one can ask is, can we trust these results also on modern code review that have the idea of inspecting code but are done in a completely different way? This is one of the things you want to test before going on and writing things about code review. So how can you empirically test what's going on? Well, one of the places in which you want to be if you do empirical research in software engineering is Microsoft Research. <coughs> I know it's a strange place to say this thing, but Microsoft Research is very open about the studies they do. So this is one of the research centers that really publishes in academic values the results of what they're doing. And these people are in tight connection with Microsoft product groups. So you can really talk, discuss, ask things to developers, analyze their data to ask the empirical question you want to answer. So I went to Microsoft Research in summer 2013 and I studied together with a researcher there, Christian Gerr. What happens? What are the practices of modern code review at Microsoft? So that we could understand them better and see what's really working and what should be improved. How did we do it? Microsoft is very interesting as a, as a place to do this kind of studies because it's all in the same place, but you have very, very different groups doing completely different things. So for example, you don't expect people in SQL Server to use the same ID that people use while developing the Windows Phone or other application. They have completely different ways of creating their products. But they have one thing in common, they all use the code flow review tool. So all these different products and many others, they use this tool for their code reviews. So this means that we can filter out problems due to different tools. They are all using the same tool. If we see some results that are different from group to group, they are not due to the fact that they use different tools. This is a very interesting opportunity to do research about this. So what did we do? Well, when you want to do these kind of studies where you really don't know where you want to go, you do something called qualitative research and you start without hypothesis and you say, okay, I want to see what people tell me about this phenomenon. So we said, okay, now we want to go and observe developers while they're doing code reviews and afterwards interview them and ask questions about what they think and the challenges and so on. So in this process we observed, we started, that's the first part of the study, we started observing 18 developers. So with different roles that signed at least 50 reviews in the lab in the previous three months. So the idea was that the code flow tools has an analytics background that could tell us whenever a new code review request was created. Once that was created, we would write to that developer and ask if they could go and observe that developer in action while doing the code review. 
So the Microsoft Campus is really huge. So I spend a lot of time on this shuttle tonight. Every time a developer would say, yes, please come and see me with my quadruple, I would jump on these shuttles and go to the beach. They have around 100 movies. It's really huge. OK. And then we, we got some findings from these interviews and observations. And we wanted to see, the most important thing we wanted to see was, first of all, why do they do contributions? We got some results from the interviews, but of course we wanted to have more people telling us what they think about that. So we also sent a survey to managers asking them, why do you ask your developers to do contributions? And these are all the reasons why they ask them to do so. And these are exactly the same reasons that you found on the survey that you just did. So to find alternative solutions, to improve the code, to find errors, so on and so forth. Okay, so in this first phase we got the possible reasons. Then we extended this to developers. We sent a survey to around 2,000 developers, almost half of them replied, asking them exactly what you did to run these motivations for new projects by important according to their opinion. And these are the results. So, why do Microsoft developers do projects? The first reason to do that for them is to find defects. 72 managers and 33 of 384 developers said that this is the main reason they do code Okay? Let's see what the thing is done. Reason for doing contributions. 
And we did a thing called car sorting. This is again another thing we do in qualitative research. We printed all these 600 cards, we spread them on a super large table, and then we started clustering them when they were talking about the same topics. And this is, for example, a stack of cards talking about, with comments about non necessary code. Okay? This was halfway through the car sorting process. And these are the results. So as you see, the main outcome of code review is code review and union death. Very well done. What defects? It's only around 14%. Right? This is very different from their expectations. And what is more, if you look at the comments about defects, you really see that they are very low-level, trivial defects. Like, what if this part is used? Any doubt about precedence? Should this be and instead of or? There are both questions, because of course it's nice to be nice when you do contributes, you don't want to attack people, that's very important for them. On the other hand, they are very, very low-level issues, not talking about design, Nothing. So basically, contribute at Microsoft, expectation do not meet reality. Okay? Now the question is, what is instead the outcome of code review in open source software systems? Okay, for this study I didn't have to go anywhere. I could do that from home, from my office, and I did that in collaboration with a very good PhD student. Uh, Marcus Keller, who did this study as part of his master's thesis. So we took a sample of two open source projects we knew very well. In this case, Chromax and Anka, but we've seen very similar results in many other projects. So what we did here, uh, we manually analyzed more than 1,000 code changes that were introduced due to review. What does it mean? This is, for example, a review happening on Garrett. This is the code submitted. And you see that, for example, here, the, this, the name of this variable has changed. Here, this comment has been removed. And here, this cursor.close was also removed. Sorry, it was up. Okay, so we analyzed more than 1,000 of these changes, and we also classified them to see which kind of changes they were. And we had this classification, so maybe it was a documentation change, it was a visual representation, like previous uh, white spaces, change in equations, so on and so forth, and some also about more functional things. So the green bars, the three bars on top, are non-functional changes, meaning changes that affect the code in a way that doesn't change the way in which the code behaves, which is very similar to what uh, Microsoft developers would recommend in comments in their code reviews. Well, these ones are the functional changes, things that really relate to bugs or to changes in functionalities, important ones. So to make this a bit bigger, Basically, in, both in Concat and Gromax, the biggest amount of changes triggered by code are about evolvability. Not really, so, better comments, better variable names, better voice spaces, and so on. And much less changes were about functions in the source code. And if you compare this to Microsoft, results are pretty similar. And if you also look at another two studies they, they've done, different researchers completely separated from us, they also found this thing. So basically, the answer to the question, the title of this talk is, what do they have in common? Well, it's the other. The motivation for Microsoft developers is finding bugs, but it's not meant for this motivation. You know it's for improving the code, but it's really amazing how, given that you have different motivations, 
The outcome is actually the same, isn't it? So, especially after the days of Microsoft, I thought, why is the expectation not really met? And this is basically what my research nowadays is about. <coughs> I thought really hard why this was happening. And the reason is that if you, who knows this book? I really recommend this book. It's about uh, research done in software engineering that, uh, that can be useful for practical purposes for real software engineers. It's a very beautiful book. And there is a one chapter about code review. And it says, code reviews, they find bugs faster and more effectively than testing or other non-debugging techniques. But, when done inefficiently, they can quickly become unproductive. Okay? So apparently, you can do code reviews, you can get very good results. And this is what you read in blog posts and so on. But you have to do that carefully. Okay? And the problem is that to do that carefully, you only have to rely on yourself. Because it's nowadays code review is a fully manual task. If you look at this tool, which is exactly the same as all the other tools, when you receive some code, what happens is that you have yourself to understand what's going on in code review, in, in the change you are reviewing, and decide whether it's a good or a bad one. Do you have any support? No. It's just you and your time that makes a code review good or bad. So, I asked you what are the challenges of doing code reviews. I would like to see if there are a few that stand out. Okay, so, that here is some. What are the challenges? Understanding the way other people think. Finding proper time to do it. <laughs> They're boring. <laughs> Keeping it constructive. Sorry? Do you increase the font size? Oh, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Takes a lot of time. Hard to wrap your head around other people's toilet types. It's hard to cycle the things. Be consistent. Proud of their code. Make it more simple. Time consuming. Get enough time to do it, ego, so on and so forth. So then, I ask this thing also to Microsoft developers, and basically the results were pretty similar. But one thing really uh, stood out as the main challenge of doing code reviews. And it's understanding. Understanding the code you receive is the most difficult thing, and is the thing that requires the most time. If you, we ask them, without letting them know that we were thinking about understanding as a challenge, how much understanding they needed to achieve these goals. And in fact, if you see, <coughs> finding defects is the activity that, that requires the highest understanding. <coughs> and this is why they didn't have so many the defects found in code reviews because it requires very high understanding, which means a lot of time. For improvements, on the other hand, you don't really need to understand the code so deeply. You can always suggest how to make your code more readable, right? And this is something you can easily do with the diff tools you have in code reviews. But understanding, there is no support for that. And so. Understanding means that if I wrote something, I generally understand what I wrote. So to have a, to triangulate this finding about understanding, we have to, so what happens if you send the code to the other? Does it take longer to review files that you are not familiar with, that files that you don't know? Yes, okay, not surprising. Just for being sure we are seeing the right thing. Is there a difference in comments feedback you receive when a reviewer is very familiar with or owner of the files? Yes, definitely. 
So understanding, knowing what you have to do is the key point. Is there a difference in comments, feedback you receive? And this is the kind of, kind of difference. People that understand the code, they have to read it. Their comments reflect their deeper understanding, more likely to find subtle defects, feedbacks, is more conceptual, better ideas approaches, instead of superficial comments. So, the main challenge, according to Microsoft developers, is understanding. But also social challenges are very, very important. And all these things are not supported by the community tools. So, what I'm trying to do with my research is, hopefully, improve code review tools. And I hope in the next few years, you will see some of these in practice, in some tools. And to do that, you need the right data and the right tools. So, who knows about software analytics? Someone. Who knows about data science? Okay. So, data science is very popular nowadays. The idea is that there is a lot of data that you can collect from different sources and you can analyze this data to get interesting results. Software analytics is basically the same thing, but applied to software engineering data. As a couple of researchers put it, software analytics is analytics of software data empowering software development individuals and teams. Let's make this a bit more clear. That's the typical desk of a software developer, and then while she's developing, she's using a lot of tools. And all these tools, the IDE, of course you don't use Visual Studio, the debugger, the versioning system, the issue tracking system, executions, the mailing list, all of these systems, they generate a lot of data. The idea of, this, uh, of software analytics is to use this data to help software engineering itself. So the idea is to take this data, you do some data mining and software analytics magic, and then you manage to help some of these tasks. An interesting thing is that when you build tools to help these tasks, they also generate more data that you can use. And I'm going to be a bit more practical in just a second. The idea is to use the same process for code review, also adding review data. Okay? So what does it mean? What can you do with this kind of things? Let me show you. My research is about data support and code review. So one thing you can do is you can write reviewers. Untangle the changes, I'm gonna tell you what this is. And for example, telling you where to look at where you have to do a code review in the first instance. So recommender for reviewers. We've just seen that it's very important that the people that you see their code understand your code. So how do I know which people I should send my code? But if you ask this to Microsoft developers, they tell you, I perfectly know who I should send my code to. And then you run some of these, and then you suggest different people, and they say, ah, that's a good one, I didn't think about it. So, the recommended for reviews, the idea is that you take the changes that you want to be reviewed, you add data from the versioning system, for example, about who changed this code first, who reviewed this code, but also from the issue tracking system, who fixed the bug, and so on and so forth. And with this data and data mining, you can easily suggest who should review your code. Isn't this something useful to have, for example, in GitHub, when you send a pull request that automatically tells you, okay, these are the best people that should review your code. And maybe if you're in a team, you also want to include some rules yourself, like saying, I always want a junior person to be there, so he or she can learn what code should look like. The second thing is untangling changes. How many times have you seen a commit in which there are multiple tasks being addressed, like bug fixing and refactoring? Like, who saw this more than 50 times? All right. The idea of this tool that we already developed is that it basically takes the changes that you would like other people to review, it 
uses data from the versioning system about past changes, but it also records a lot of data while we are developing. We have created a plugin in the IDE for this. And automatically, it splits this change into self-contained changes that should be reviewed in different instances. I don't have time to give you all the details, but you can contact me and I'm very happy to talk about this. But just to make you realize how much power you have if you analyze the data that developers produce to have the input. And finally, <coughs> developers always don't have much time, so you want them to focus on the things that may be the most recent, right? So that they check these things first, and then if they have a bit more time, they maybe can check the other things. And this you can do. If you analyze the history of past defects, the history of changes of files, you can really pinpoint parts that are very likely to have bugs. And for example, with this we created a plugin in Ether that tells you also using static analysis tools like FineBugs, PMD, and so on, that tells you, wait, look carefully at these files because they are critical, there might be errors. Okay, so these are three things you can do, but we have many other things in mind, and I hope this, is, this triggers some interest for me about these things. And one thing we are also working on is creating an analytics platform for GitHub, basically a plugin that will record how you use GitHub to request, so that we can understand it better and provide better tools, because it's not about of course, this data can be anonymized, but the idea is to use data for good users in this data. Okay, so that's the overall idea, and it's based on the difference between the outcome, the expectation, and outcome of community. So this concludes my talk. I would like to summarize it a bit. So the question was, what do we contribute? Microsoft and an open source are common. I explain you why I think it's important to, to do research on what we do. We did an empirical study at Microsoft to see how developers do what we use there. We found that expectations do not match reality. And the outcome is exactly the same in open source software systems, even though we knew that the outcome was a different one than Microsoft. Thought. And why this happens? Why don't we do deep code reviews? Why do we find shallow things? Because very code reviews is a very difficult task and now it's fully mapped. The idea is to bring data to have code review. Okay? Before concluding my talk, if you like these topics, I'm looking for two PhD students working with me. And if you happen to be a master student, I'm also always looking for great master students to work with to write a great master thesis. Okay. And this concludes my talk. Thank you. So thank you very much. Are there further questions? May I know who asked the first person?
you're not going to get that feedback from somebody confident enough to do it. When you untangle the code, you permit codes to run large partnerships, run large gene sets, but what you really want is for them to come back in for a view very, very regularly in small increments. Um, have I had something? Okay, so thank you so much for this contrasting point of view. So, you are, you are basically saying that if I understand correctly, that it's better to have someone who has a standard code to review your code so that you know what you have to do to make it more real. I totally agree with you. Definitely. And this is why it's very important when you have a recommender for reviewers that you let people the possibility to put rules like I want junior people or I want someone who's really not expert. But as long as you don't have data to know who's not expert, how can you know that? This is one part. The second part is unfortunately sometimes there is not a lot of time for the regular tools. So, and we have wonderful static analysis tools that, for example, you can do the formatting, white spacing, variable renaming, all for you. So, why not using that in the context of code And let the reviewers spend a bit more time on the more important parts. So, I totally agree with you. This is an important part. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, you said um, that the code reviews, uh, you said that the, the code reviews, I mean, you focus on two, two main things, like improving code, uh, code style, standards, immutability, and everything, and uh, solve, like removing bugs in these code reviews. Um, then there's one thing that's really hard to test, but if you're already doing research into this, I think it would be really fun to look at, is how many bugs are actually avoided because of refactoring the code so it's uh, more usable in the future? Like, if you have uh, a lot of copy pasted code and the reviewer will say, hey, th I mean, this looks the same on these two levels and you can reuse it and just refactor it so that you put it in a function and then in the end when someone changes something in there, like the copy pasted part will be attached as well and you will avoid bugs in the future because of improving code uh, quality. So I'm, the, the distinction between those two uh, is not as clear cut as one would think. And my question is, uh, have you looked into this and would it be uh, possible to have some metrics on how many bugs are avoided due to better code uh, quality that you get from reviews? Okay, this is a very fascinating uh, question. So, it's always very difficult to do studies and find the reason why a bug is found. And it's even more difficult to find the reason why a bug is not found. What I'm saying is, it's very hard to say if a practice has reduced the amount of bugs, especially because there are many factors that lead to bugs, that's it's very difficult to see. But definitely, I agree with you that code quality also improves, well, makes bugs less likely. People know understand code better, so there will be less bugs. So this is a very interesting study. I will, I will think about how to do this. Thank you. Um, to go back to the previous point, and in our organization, for junior developers, we actually do two code reviews. One that focuses on correctness and you know, bugs. And then the second one, which is called the readability review, that focuses only on style and clarity. And it's um, self-selected reviews that care about this sort of thing, and it's been very good. And it does help a lot. Thank you. So it's very interesting to hear about these different practices. So in the sample we started at Microsoft, they didn't have this division. They may have someone like a tester or even a project manager to look as a reviewer of the code, just to get the for example, but they wouldn't comment or say anything about it. But this is, thank you for sharing. Yeah.
sondern wirkt so ein Vorsprung als das Wort. Even more than for the quality. The main purpose of what we do is actually to get the design of the So uh, that's in some sense much easier in finding bugs. As long as you have experience in the theory, you, you get immediately to the design is right or wrong. Yeah. So uh, that's the point of having a subject matter experts, not just people who are good at doing their work. For, for finding bugs, there's stuff like uh, static analyzers, over a or whatever. I think finding bugs in the world review is important, but overrated. That's so I haven't found like any traces of these high level issues that you are talking about, like this code should not be this way, it should be factored, but changing completely, change the code. I haven't seen that. Probably because they did this kind of design videos a bit before. But that's another thing. But basically, you don't have any support for it in the project you choose. And it would be good, for example, thinking about software visualization if these could have these things. Studied this in terms of 
help you with awareness. But normally developers will have time to review all the changes, all of that. So two to three seems to be a reasonable number. Does, does it answer your question? Okay, thank you very, very much for the talk. It was very interesting to hear also. We have many questions about that and discussion. It was not only a really, really question, but discussion. I loved it. And I think we all loved it. So thank you very much.